Will you visit with me while I tell you how I think peace can best be preserved and our children allowed to grow up in a country that is free and independent? Back in 1940, tourists came from far and near to admire the fabulous new bridge at Tacoma, Washington. To make it so beautiful, the engineers who built it had cast aside the tradition that demanded massive strength. The unusual bridge design with its slender girders was based on the belief that a bridge should be flexible instead of firm. Because it would sway with the winds instead of resisting them, the natives dubbed the bridge Galloping Gertie. To protect its investment, the city of Tacoma took out a large insurance policy on the bridge. Four months after the bridge opened, an unexpected wind came. With each gust, the flexible bridge flexed a little more. Finally, Galloping Gertie flexed right off her supporting cables and plunged into Puget Sound. Immediate plans were made to rebuild the bridge with the payment from the insurance company. Then the awful truth was revealed. One of the insurance agents had been so sure the bridge would never fall that he had diverted the annual premium to his own pocket. When he had looked at the bridge with its fortune in modern steel, he had gambled that it can't happen here. But his gamble failed and trusting people discovered too late they did not have the protection they paid for. For four years, the Kennedy-Johnson administration has pretended to spend more than 50% of the annual federal budget on defense. American taxpayers think they are buying military strength and security against our enemies. But the plain fact is, we are the victims of the biggest jip in history. We are not getting the defense protection we are paying for. Lyndon Johnson and Robert McNamara are taking two dangerous gambles with the lives of 190 million Americans. Like the Tacoma Bridge designer, they are gambling that accommodation with our enemies is better than strength and that being flexible is safer than being firm. Like the Tacoma insurance agent who gambled the bridge would never fall, Johnson and McNamara are gambling that the Soviets will never attack. They are betting that Khrushchev didn't mean it when he said, we will bury you. They are gambling that the communists, after successfully conquering one billion people, will suddenly about face and abandon their goal of world conquest. They are gambling that the Soviets, who have broken their agreement with every country to whom they ever gave a promise, have suddenly become trustworthy. Do you want to risk your life and the lives of your children on the Johnson-McNamara gamble? Twice during the last four years, the present administration gambled with our safety and lost. You would be dead now if your life had been staked on the gamble of the Kennedy-Johnson administration in 1961 that we could continue to trust the Soviets not to betray the nuclear test ban. All the world knows now that the Soviets, without any warning and in the midst of negotiations in Geneva, set off a series of multi-megaton bombs many times larger than anything the U.S. has exploded before or since. You would be dead now if your life had been staked on the gamble made by the same administration in 1962 that we could trust the Soviets not to put any missiles in Cuba. All the world knows now that the Soviets were doing precisely that at the very time the Soviet ambassador was in the White House promising the contrary to President Kennedy. Most Americans still do not realize how close we came to nuclear destruction during the Cuban crisis. This was revealed by the head of the U.S. Marine Corps, General David M. Shoup, when he made his official report on New Year's Day, 1963. He began his message with these words, Only by the grace of God and an aerial photograph am I able to address many of you today in person instead of your spirit. What did General Shoup mean? He meant that only by the grace of God in an aerial photograph was our country saved from nuclear destruction in October 1962. This was confirmed by a newspaper man who was a close personal friend of President Kennedy. His authentic newspaper column revealed that the vital photograph was taken by a U-2 plane flown over Cuba only in the last desperate measure of time because of the public and political pressure to do something about Cuba.
The U-2 flights had been stopped because the administration believed the Soviets were mellowing and would never take any offensive action in Cuba. The very first flight after the U-2 was restored revealed the Soviet missiles zeroed in on U.S. targets. Once the picture was taken, the element of surprise was gone and Khrushchev was quite willing to pull them out and wait for another opportunity to catch us off guard for a surprise attack. Now the same administration, which twice gambled with our safety and lost, is staking American lives on the greatest gamble since the dawn of civilization, the gamble that the Soviets will never attack. On this gamble, the administration is failing to give us the defense we are paying for, the defense which can give us peace without surrender. You and the lives of your children are staked on this gamble. This dangerous gamble has resulted in what can be accurately described as the McNamara Gap. Here is the defense the American people have been paying for, but are not getting because of the gaps in our military strength created by Robert Strange McNamara. First, the McNamara Gap on land. Our bases in Turkey and Italy, capable of firing 45 Jupiter missiles deep into the USSR, have been dismantled. Four Thor bases in England with 60 missiles have been dismantled. Our giant Air Force bomber bases in England, Spain, Morocco, Libya, and Guam are now being closed down. The production of nuclear materials for military purposes has been cut 50%. The U.S. has failed to make any effort to match the Soviets in chemical and bacteriological warfare. Here is the McNamara Gap on the sea. Our 15 attack aircraft carriers are being stripped of their strategic nuclear bombers. Our surface ships are not being armed with Polaris missiles. McNamara canceled the Typhoon missile ships. We have retreated from the Mediterranean, where our bases had been a powerful deterrent to Soviet attack. The McNamara gap in the air has resulted from canceling the Nike Zeus anti-missile missile, abandoning the Skybolt missile, which would enable us to bomb targets within Russia without flying over Soviet soil and stopping production of the bombers, which are the backbone of our strategic air command. McNamara has also scrapped the Atlas missile, the Pluto missile, and the dinosaur orbital bomber. This chart shows how McNamara is scrapping more than 90% of our nuclear striking power by eliminating manned bombers and European missile bases. For the first time in 25 years, no U.S. bombers are under development or construction. Many of the bombers we have are scheduled to be placed on the bomber bonfire Dean Rusk is offering Khrushchev. The result is shown by this third chart. McNamara is reducing our nuclear delivery systems from 30 to 40 billion tons of TNT to only 2 billion tons. The McNamara gap also results from weaker warhead power, less megatonnage in our missiles. The Joint Chiefs of Staff testified that the USSR is ahead of us in high-yield bomb power. Yet McNamara is cutting down U.S. bomb warheads to one megaton, while Khrushchev concentrates on 100 megaton bombs. When all the pieces are put together, the McNamara Gap presents a pattern of U.S. disarmament that one does not have to be a military expert to see. The present administration seems determined to lose the nuclear arms race, just as it lost the Bay of Pigs invasion and is now losing South Vietnam. How did the United States get to the point where the Secretary of Defense is disarming instead of defending America? At the end of World War II, the United States was the most powerful nation in all history. The Soviet Union was devastated pulled through to victory only by $11 billion of American Lend-Lease aid. How could this third-rate power, which had difficulty defeating little Finland, hope to compete with the United States? Obviously, it didn't have a chance, militarily or economically. There was only one field in which the communists clearly outdistanced Americans, in psychological warfare. The communists developed their secret weapon, which J. Edgar Hoover called opinion subversion, the direct attempt to influence American opinion. The Reds made the disarmament of the United States a do-it-yourself project for Americans. In the late 1950s, 
in spite of the tremendous successes of Soviet atomic spies, in spite of our slowdown in the development of the H-bomb, in spite of our abandoning victory in the Korean War, America still had a commanding two-to-one lead across the entire spectrum of the technology of nuclear weapons. How then could Khrushchev fulfill his wish to bury us? The Soviet psychological warfare experts conceived a bold plan to accomplish what Soviet scientists and military men were unable to do. They decided to trick the United States into stopping all nuclear development while the Soviets secretly raced ahead. To lull us, the communists developed their famous slogan called peaceful coexistence. The joker in this slogan is like one of the famous sideshows in the old P.T. Barnum circus. Barnum used to advertise, come one, come all, see the fulfillment of the biblical prophecy that the lion and the lamb shall lie down together. Wonder of wonders, Barnum could show his customers a lion and a lamb coexisting together in the same cage. The only trouble was, Barnum had to discontinue the show. It got too expensive. It cost a fresh lamb for every show. After the lion had eaten the lamb, then they coexisted. And this is the only way the communists want to coexist with America. In 1958, the slogan, rather red than dead, was launched by Lord Bertrand Russell, prominent British socialist and pacifist, when he openly advocated surrender to the communists. By 1962, there were Easter peace walks in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Detroit, and Chicago, peace balloons at the World's Fair, and peace pickets in front of the White House. The next wave of disarmament propaganda was designed to appeal to the average middle-class American who loves his family, goes to the movies, and watches television. For this large group, the communists fashioned the slogan, Nuclear War is Unthinkable. In marketing this slogan, the Reds made great capital out of the movies On the Beach, Dr. Strangelove, and Seven Days in May, and of the novel Fail Safe. These stories sell us on the falsehood that our greatest danger is from accidental nuclear war probably from some mishap within the United States, rather than from the Soviets who have vowed to bury us. This propaganda is cleverly designed to instill in Americans a fear of the nuclear weapon itself, rather than of the Soviets who will pull the trigger. This is as senseless as putting weapons in our prison instead of the murderers and robbers who use them. Disarmament propaganda that is specifically designed to appeal to idealistic Americans is concentrated in the slogan, Disarmament Prevents War. The success of this slogan is a fantastic achievement of the big lie because it is contrary to all historical evidence. Fortunately for civilization, the West was not disarmed at critical times in history when barbarian invaders attacked. It was not an armament race which caused World War II. Because England and America disarmed under the influence of the Kellogg anti-war pact, the Japanese, Nazis, and Soviets knew they were much better armed than the West and could win great victories as soon as they triggered war. The disarmament treaties of the West merely invited and encouraged the aggressors to attack. General Thomas S. Power, distinguished head of our Strategic Air Command, said, any lawyer would indict disarmament as the arch-villain of history. It has been tried again and again since centuries before Christ, and it has always led to war, never to peace. Now let us see how false disarmament notions work their way into the highest echelons of our government. A little-known incident from World War II illustrates how impractical bureaucrats can be. During World War II, the Board of Economic Warfare learned that the German troops used rabbit skins to keep warm on the Russian front. So this New Deal agency developed its preemptive project to win the war in a hurry. It was to buy up all the rabbits in Europe and thereby cause the Germans to freeze to death in Russia. Of course, the well-known ability of rabbits to multiply especially when their owners are encouraged by dollars, 
soon caused the rabid population of Europe to exceed even the funds of the bureaucrats. This harebrained scheme for winning the war by cornering the market in rabbits was sound and logical compared with the disarmament schemes of the Johnson administration. One of those who worked for the Board of Economic Warfare was Paul H. Nietzsche. In April 1960, this same Paul Nietzsche addressed the National Strategy Seminar at Asilomar, California. He said that in a poker game with several players, the most dangerous hand is not the worst hand, but the second best hand. With the second best hand, one is tempted to follow up the betting, but if one does, one gets clobbered. Nietzsche then applied the poker analogy to U.S. nuclear strategy and launched the notion, for which there is no basis in all military history, that it is safer to be weak than strong. He then presented a detailed proposal that the United States disarm, scrap our military superiority, and then invite the Soviets to disarm after we do. The new Kennedy-Johnson administration, elected seven months later, couldn't wait to get Nietzsche into its official family. In spite of his shocking disarmament proposals, or maybe because of them, Nietzsche was selected to be Assistant Secretary of Defense even before Kennedy and Johnson were sworn in. In 1963, Nietzsche was promoted to Secretary of the Navy. In November 1960, another meeting took place which affects the life and security of Americans, the Moscow Pugwash Conference, which brought together top-level Soviet and U.S. scientists. The American group was headed by Dr. Jerome B. Wiesner and Dr. Walt W. Rostow, who unfolded their ideas for dismantling U.S. military strength. Within weeks, Wiesner and Rostow became leading policy planners of the Kennedy-Johnson administration. When another Pugwash conference was held this year in India, President Lyndon Johnson sent the conference a message that its program will be studied thoroughly by me and by this government in our continued effort to achieve workable disarmament. The Nietzsche and Pugwash plans were soon translated into official policy by the new administration. In September 1961, the State Department issued publication 7277 called Freedom from War, the United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. According to this document, published by the Government Printing Office, the United States intends to abolish our Army, our Navy, our Air Force, and our nuclear weapons in three stages at the end of which time we will be subject to a United Nations Peace Force. Later, the State Department made it clear that this is planned to be completed within nine years. The following year, the disarmament crowd in the administration crawled even farther out of the woodwork and published the Liberal Papers, which specifically espouses the rather red-than-dead line and calls for unilateral disarmament. The storm that was raised at the grassroots of America by the publication of these two documents, convinced the planners in the Johnson administration that hereafter they should not let the American public know what surrender plans they have in store for us. They adopted the attitude so graphically expressed by Harry Hopkins, the public is too dumb to understand. First, there was the secret Fulbright Memorandum, which laid down the policy known as muzzling the military. Next, there was the secret Rostow Report, a master plan on foreign policy and disarmament, written by Walt W. Rostow, chairman of the State Department Policy Planning Board. It calls for general and complete disarmament put over on the American people by a systematic publicity campaign. When Rostow was summoned before a Senate committee to answer questions on his report, he hid behind the executive Fifth Amendment. The Johnson administration still thinks the public is too dumb to be permitted to read the secret Rostow report. We have only recently become aware of an even more far-reaching secret report for the President Johnson called the Phoenix Report. This document is amazing 
not only for the fantastic policies it suggests, but for the double-dealing way it recommends that they be carried out. Thus, the Phoenix Report advised the President not to announce that he intends to disarm America because that would not be popular. Instead, the President is advised to push for a tax cut, which is always popular, so that our military strength can be cut back without the American people realizing that unilateral disarmament is the hidden purpose of the tax cut. The Phoenix Report even calls upon us to consider unification of the U.S. with the Soviet Union. This, no doubt, is one of the proposals the Johnson administration is saving until after the November election to implement. In 1960, Khrushchev said, In the short time I still have to live, I would like to see the day when the communist flag flies over the whole world. As he surveys the world situation today, this is what he sees. The Soviet economy has cracked and Soviet agriculture is incapable of feeding its own people. He knows he can never bury us by peaceful competition. There is one area, however, which offers Khrushchev the easy road to fulfill his hope of global conquest. The surprise nuclear attack, which would destroy most of the United States. History shows that the communists believe in surprise attacks on their victims. This was the way the Reds attacked Poland, Finland, Japanese Manchuria, and South Korea. The disarmament carried out by the Johnson administration has made America a tender target which invites and encourages Khrushchev to launch a nuclear Pearl Harbor or threaten us with an ultimatum to surrender. The McNamara Gap has given the Soviets the opening communism has waited for since Lenin. It is Lyndon Johnson who is really risking nuclear war, invited by American weakness. The master communist Lenin once boasted, in the end, a funeral requiem will be sung over the Soviet Republic or over world capitalism. Nikita Khrushchev, however, has changed the prediction to this. History is on our side. We will bury you. Why is it that Khrushchev is so confident of burying us when Lenin thought communism had only a 50-50 chance? The answer is that Khrushchev has the help of American gravediggers. These men are not communists. They are card-carrying liberals. They will not commit the crime. They will merely dig the grave. These grave diggers today are firmly entrenched in the Johnson administration. On November 3rd, we have a clear choice between the phony peace they offer us, which will lead inevitably to a nuclear Pearl Harbor, or we can choose peace and freedom through preparedness. The issue is survival. If our choice is wrong, there will be no second chance. At certain climactic times in history, there is such a thing as the irreplaceable man. In 1964, Barry Goldwater is the irreplaceable man. Only he has the knowledge of the danger we are in because of the McNamara Gap and the political prestige to do anything about it. Only he has the strength and leadership to turn the gravediggers out of office. Only he can give us true and lasting peace without surrender. Barry Goldwater knows that American strength and nuclear power are the last best hope of the free world, and indeed our only hope that our children can grow up in a free and independent country. He knows that the sage advice given us by George Washington is our best maxim today. If we desire to secure peace, it must be known that we are at all times ready for war. Wise young aviators have a saying, I don't want to be the hottest pilot, just the oldest. To become the oldest pilot requires a career of life or death decisions made prudently and promptly. There is no margin for error, for reckless acts or late decisions. Barry Goldwater is one of America's oldest jet pilots. His would be the safest, surest hand to have on our nuclear trigger. The American people must not fall victim to the cleverest communist slogan of them all. It can't happen here. Every country taken over by the communists had its citizens thinking this. 
Newspaper man George Sikorsky told of being in Russia in the months before the Bolsheviks took over, and how the businessmen and nobility stood around at their parties and laughed at the parlor pinks as a harmless, ragged bunch. Within a few months, all those who laughed were dead or in exile. Recently, I came across a letter from a young refugee from Czechoslovakia, which vividly describes how that once prosperous nation slipped behind the Iron Curtain. Everybody took it for granted that because we were a freedom-loving people, we could never lose freedom. We paid no attention to repeated warnings that the communists were infiltrating into the heart of everything that affected our destiny. The majority of us went on living in our smug little worlds, too busy with business, parties, ski trips, and the rest to realize the frightful penalty we were soon to pay for our neglect. One morning, our bitter fate came upon us like a shot out of hell. We were helpless to do anything about it. Machine guns lined the streets, the government, the army, the schools, communications. Everything had been taken over by the communists overnight. Will we ever get another chance? Then there was Cuba. We were told it couldn't possibly happen there. The Monroe Doctrine and the U.S. Navy would prevent it. Anyway, the Latins were far too volatile ever to be regimented by communist discipline. But Cuba is a communist island today. We must not let pride and prosperity tell us it can't happen here. It can happen here, and it will happen here, via a nuclear Pearl Harbor or a surrender ultimatum, unless the voters in America turn out of office the grave diggers who are preparing our grave so Khrushchev can bury it. A vote for Lyndon Johnson is a vote for war from weakness. A vote for Barry Goldwater is a vote for peace through strength. This is the choice we must make for ourselves and for our children on November the 3rd.